Hey, what's up, everybody? Doran Aldana here coming at you with another kick-ass episode of the Art of Mortgage Marketing podcast. And today we're going to talk about something very timely because it's going to connect with the plight of many in the industry right now. And that is how to conquer your fear, how to master your fear, how to use it not to paralyze you, but to propel you, how to have it be an asset as opposed to a liability. So we're going to get into it today. It's certainly going to be a very applicable and timely conversation, as I just mentioned, simply because, of course, right now, there's so much going on in the market, right? So the first question, of course, begging to be asked is why is conquering your fear so important? Well, first and foremost, obviously, right now, the current market shift has a lot of loan officers, mortgage brokers, and mortgage bankers in freakout mode, to say the least, right? That's the understatement of the year. With rising rates and uh, hyper competition, margin compression, everyone in their dog chasing after the same realtors, a lot of buyers being priced out of the market. For a lot of mortgage professionals, it's an absolute shitstorm, right? The uh, low-hanging fruit that a lot of loan officers enjoyed over the last several years has officially dried up. Refis have dried up. All that easy money that was once there that had the phone ringing without doing virtually any work or proactive prospecting whatsoever, it's all dried up. So the flow has now grinded to a halt. And now it's a very, very slow ebb. And so a lot of loan officers are feeling it. Their income is a fraction of what it was the last year or two or three. A lot of mortgage professionals are chewing up savings. They're jacking up their credit card, chewing up their net worth. A lot of loan officers have already left the, bit of the, the industry. Many have already been chewed up and spat out. They're dropping like flies. Many others are on the verge and they're biting their nails, freaking out, and for good reason, because what worked in a low-hanging fruit market just is not working anymore. You know, the proverbial refi crabs who are crawling out under who are underneath the refi rocks enjoying all that low-hanging fruit with refis are now crawling out from underneath their proverbial refi rocks and clamoring after the same realtors. And so if they didn't have a kick-ass unique value proposition, if they didn't have a proven method to penetrate the purchase market, chances are they're having a very difficult time right now getting new realtor partners because these realtor partners, these, you know, not just uh, the whining, stimulant, complaining, jelly donut eating, low producing realtors, but the ones that actually can send business, the higher producers, the ones that are least and last affected by market downturns versus first and most, those ones are getting pounded by loan officers every single day. And so if you're making overtures and you're noticing that they're repelling your overture because they deem you an unwelcome, annoying pest instead of a welcome guest, you're probably right now in a bit of freak out mode because you know you need to get some partners on board. You know you need to find a way to push the needle on profit and performance in your business, but you just don't really know how to break through the resistance, the apathy, the cynicism, the resignation. And so there's a lot of rejection, a, lot, a high wall of resistance holding a lot, a lot of loan officers and mortgage professionals back from being able to make successful overtures and to be able to generate consistent lead flow that's of high caliber and high quality quality you know the qualified borrowers versus you know just chaff that wastes your time that's unqualified and of course right now with rates going up a lot of buyers are being priced out of the market so there's a lot of needles to thread right now as to how to penetrate the purchase market and how to not just survive but in many mortgage professionals cases just to thrive how do we do it well, of course, what shows up in the face of this conundrum and this puzzlement prison that a lot of mortgage professionals fall into right now is fear. It's a very natural human response to feel that fear because they just don't know what they're going to do and how they're going to reverse the tide as the savings continue to get chewed up, as the pipeline continues to dwindle, as the income continues to dry up and the bills keep coming in right? There's a lifestyle that a lot of mortgage professionals have become accustomed to eating all that low hanging fruit, being fat, 
lazy and happy, maybe not lazy because many of you were swept off your feet with loans, but it was lazy from a standpoint of being proactive with prospecting, proactive with, you know, actual systems and tools and campaigns and methods that proactively bring in business consistently in the purchase market, not just in the refi market, but the purchase market. And if you didn't have a system in place to do that, that's when you're hitting the ground hard as rates go up, refis dry up, and you're in scramble mode trying to recoup that lost revenue. But truth be told, anytime that we step out of our comfort zone, whether it be asking a girl out for a date, proposing, whether it be getting on stage for an audition, if you're an actor uh, and you've never done that play before, or you've never, never done that act before, whether it be picking up the phone to make a prospecting call, whether it be doing something we've never done before, making a bold, intelligent, strategic investment in ourselves. Anytime we step out of our comfort zone and go after something big and audacious in our life, we tend to hit what's called the fear barrier. The late and great Bob Proctor, he called it the, the terror barrier, because anytime we step out of our comfort zone, we're leaving what we know, what we're comfortable with, what we're accustomed to, and we're leaving the known and we're stepping into the unknown. And that's mighty comfortable uh, if you're used to that. But most of, us, most of us are not used to stepping out of our comfort zone. Most of us are used to staying inside of our comfort zone. So if we don't have a habit, if we haven't cultivated the mindset and the lifestyle of being comfortable, being uncomfortable, stepping out of our comfort zone is mighty uncomfortable. And that causes us to bristle in fear. We contract and we put our tail between our legs and we tend to go back and retreat back into our comfort zone. And that's why most people stay at the same level of income for years and years and years. That's why most people have a very difficult time consistently growing their income because in order to grow, we have to stay out of our comfort zone. And the definition of the opposite, the antithesis of growth is stagnation. And stagnation is basically a rut with the two ends. It's basically a grave with the two ends knocked out. You know, that's rut prison, living in a prison of doing the same old thing, getting the same old results. And so a lot of mortgage professionals have hit that point of diminishing return as of late with what has been working for them for many, many years in a refi market. And now it's shifted to this purchase market and they're being pushed out of their comfort zone. And that causes, as human beings, we tend to feel fear when we step out of our comfort zone. So there's two ways to step out of our comfort zone, either by choice where we say, screw it, let's do it. I feel the fear. I do it anyways. I'm getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Well, that's how champions roll. And that is by choice when we do that, because we're more committed to our dream than we than our comfort zone. We're more committed to finding a solution than we are wallowing in our fear, playing a victim to circumstance, right? So that's by choice. Or it's by circumstance where we're literally pushed out of the nest to grow wings on the way down. And it's scary as shit, right? When we have that experience of being forced into the fire, being forced out of the nest. It's scary because, again, what happens if we, we don't take flight and we land splat on the ground? That hurts, right? There's real consequences to failure. There's real consequences to financial peril. There's real consequences to being up to our eyeballs in debt. There's real consequence, consequences to being unemployed or not being able to make the same kind of money or not being able to have the same level of freedom, autonomy, independence, there's real consequences to have to be able to tell our families, we can't afford to do this. We can't afford to do that, to have to cram our life into a smaller budget box. There's real consequences to have to admit defeat and failure and to be able to tell our spouse, our significant other, our kids, I failed. I wasn't able to make my business work and to have to go back to nine to five prison, right? That hurts. There's real consequences. So we're talking about this because, you know, the consequences are real. And I want to equip you guys to be able to tip the scales of fortune in your favor so that in spite of the market, in spite of these challenges, in spite of the shitstorm you might be facing right now, that you can rise up in the face of it and win. 
that you can turn this adversity into opportunity, that you can take this quote unquote set back and turn it into a set up that it wouldn't be a stumbling block for you. It'd be a stepping stone that it would have you rise up and win like never before. That's my hope, wish, and prayer for you. And I trust that's likewise for yourself. And the difference between the top producers, the top 1% income earners, and the mediocre majority is how they deal with fear. Because everyone feels fear. I feel fear. You feel fear. It's a human experience. We all feel fear. One of the differences that makes the difference that separates the top producers, the elite uber successful high achievers from all the rest is how they respond to versus react to the fear experience of life as a human beings on the front lines of real life. So let's get into it and do it, shall we? The first thing I want to talk about is the fear response, the fear response. What is the fear response? Well, our nervous system runs on two modes, two different modes that it runs on, kind of like a vehicle that has first gear and second gear. There's two different gears that we run on as human beings. The first one is called parasympathetic. It's kind of like a parachute, right? Parasympathetic. When you jump out of an airplane and you know, you've never done it before, what's the biggest fear you have? Will my chute open, right? And so your heart's pounding and you're in total freak out mode. And you say, screw it, let's do it. And you jump from the plane. And even if you're, in, you're doing it tandem, which of course you do when you first jump out of a plane, I've never done it because I'm not crazy like that. And I don't have the desire to do it. But if I did, the biggest question in my mind is, holy crap, I sure freaking hope my chute opens, right? But as soon as we pull the cord and the chute opens, we have this huge relief, right? It's like all that tension relaxes. So that's a great way to remind yourself about the word parasympathetic because the word parachute is similar to parasympathetic. And it's this mode where we're in peace. It's like the mode we have where when we're at the spa getting a massage, right? We're relaxed, we're peaceful, we're in faith, we're in certainty, and we're just in that beautiful comfort zone of knowing everything is all good, all is well in our world, right? We have total certainty, total peace, total faith, total relaxation, okay? That's when we're sleeping well every night, parasympathetic. The second mode is the sympathetic mode. That's where... You know, prior to jumping out of the plane, if you don't know whether or not the uh, the shoot um, opens, you know, you're going to be probably pretty tense, right? If you don't have certainty that the shoot shoot is going to actually release when you pull the cord, there's going to be a lot of tension, a lot of fear, a lot of stress, right? So the sympathetic mode has us in this contractive state where we are very fearful and everything is tense. So that's the fight, flight, or freeze mode that we find ourselves in. And it's a self-protective mechanism to keep us safe. So each mode, both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic, has a unique biological, biochemical, biochemical and physiological response. And that response is unique for each mode. So let's break this down. The parasympathetic is a sensory awareness that broadens, right? We have this ability to take in all our senses, what we feel, we smell, we taste, we see, we touch, and we hear, we take it all in. Our sensory acuity and our sensory input allows us to take it all in. We're able to broaden our awareness of our senses. Our heart rate, what do you think our heart rate does when we're at peace? It drops, right? It's at a resting heart rate, a comfortable and normal resting heart rate. What about our breathing? What happens to our breathing when we're in that relaxed state? Of course, it deepens and it slows. What about our muscle tension? Are we more tense or less tense? We're less tense because we're relaxed, right? We're in that spa zen-like state. And what happens to our biochemistry? 
we have an influx of all those happy drugs in our bloodstream, like endorphins, like serotonin. And so these happy drugs, as I like to call them, they infiltrate our bloodstream. And that's why we're more inclined to be happy-go-lucky. We've got pep in our steps, sparkle in our eye. And we feel powerful. We feel peaceful. We feel resourceful, right? We're at that ideal level where we just really feel dialed in. Uh, we can be too, too peaceful where we feel sluggish. So we don't want to be too peaceful where we're in a half you know, sleep coma, com comatose state. There is a certain degree of arousal that helps us bring out our best. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. But the parasympathetic state is a state that is very calm, very peaceful, very relaxed. And it allows us to sleep well every night because we don't have any tension in our lives. We don't have any stress. Now, obviously, our business, the mortgage business, can be very stressful. It's very deadline driven. So oftentimes, just living in this industry by virtue of the deadlines and the high stakes and the fact that this is the biggest asset and the biggest amount of money that most of our clients are ever going to invest in an asset, there can be a lot of tension just because there it feels like there's a lot at stake. So even if you know our bank account's looking great, we can live from you know, deal to deal to deal as deals derail in this very fearful state. And so even when we're making great money, we're not really enjoying the ride because we're constantly shifting out of the parasympathetic into the sympathetic. So what's the sympathetic response? The sympathetic response, think about it like this. If someone is, you know, really going through a lot of stress and they're going through a lot of drama and trauma, we feel sympathy, right? So that's a good way to remember that one is that, man, I feel sorry for you. Sympathetic, right? So what happens to our awareness when we're in the sympathetic, when we're in that contractive stressed out state? Our sensory awareness, does it expand or does it narrow? It narrows, right? If you're walking through the woods and you hear a sound and it sounds like a bear, what do you do? You instantly freeze in your tracks and your focus is instantly on that sound, right? There's nothing else you're paying attention to. All you're focusing on is where did that sound come from, right? Same thing if you're running uh, late at night through uh, a trail or early in the morning and it's dark out and you hear a, a, a stick snap, what happens? You stop, you freeze in your tracks and you focus like a laser beam or you run like hell, right? One or the other. But our awareness doesn't broaden, it narrows like a laser beam to the danger that we perceive. So that's often what happens. We narrow our focus and we're focusing on the debt load. We're focusing on the bank account dwindling. We're focusing on the pipeline that's dwindling. We're focusing on all the bills that come in. Our sensory awareness focuses on the danger. You may have noticed, right? As of late, if your bank account has been dwindling, you're more obsessed with it than you ever have. Why? Because there's danger. It's high alert, right? The alarm bells are going off. What happens to our heartbeat? it goes up. And what happens to our breathing? It becomes more shallow and more rapid. What happens to our muscle tension? It tenses up. It tenses up like a vice grip, right? That's where we get knots in our back. We get knots in our shoulder and our neck. We get a knot in our stomach. We got uh, you know, a, uh, a knot in our neck or our, in our throat, right? We get that lump in our throat. And we have a surge of the opposite of the happy drugs in our bloodstream. We have a, a surge of the stress response drugs, which are cortisol and adrenaline. So that's where we can get a short-term boost of energy because, you know, back in the day when we were fighting off saber two tigers, that was a real physical threat we needed to respond to. We needed to either fight, flight, or freeze just to survive, right? In many cases, it was fight or flight. And so it would give us that additional boost to be able to fight and come up on top and to save our life or our family's life, our loved one's life, or it would allow us, allow us to outrun the predator. And so while that helps us to survive a real physical threat, the problem is now we're not fighting saber-toothed tigers. Now we're fighting saber-toothed tigers in our own head, in our own imagination. And so that's the slippery slope. But fear is a biochemical 
physiological response to a perceived threat, real or imagined, and it's designed to keep us safe. That's the big thing to remember, that it's actually a mechanism that's designed to help us preserve life and to protect us from harm and threat. Now, of course, the obvious question begging to be asked is, how does fear hinder us? If it's you know, designed to keep us safe, well, why are we talking about trying to conquer it and master it? Well, because unfortunately, fear ends up hindering us as opposed to helping us in many cases, because our brain is really bad at distinguishing between a real immediate physical threat like a cyber, saber tooth tiger and something that's vividly imagined in our own head. So, for example, when we're afraid of the debt load mounting, we focus on the debt load and we're focusing on the fact that bills keep coming in and the bank account dwindles. And all of a sudden we start to, ten we start to tense up. We start, our, our breath starts to go shallow. Our heartbeat starts to pound harder and we start to have a heart race and we start to have adrenaline and cortisol pumping through our bloodstream. And it's if, as if it's getting worse and worse and worse, even worse than what it actually is because we're imagining it, right? And we're imagining the worst case scenario. Similar sort of thing, like if you have a bad dream, right? You have a bad dream. One of the ones that's scariest for me is falling. For some reason, I have a fear of falling, a fear of heights, which is probably one of the reasons why I've never jumped out of a plane. So maybe I need to jump out of a plane so I can overcome that fear. That'd probably be a good idea because the best way to overcome a fear is to face the fear and to not run from it, but face it. So I can take my own medicine on that one. But when we imagine in a dream that we're falling from a skyscraper, to the ground plummeting, what happens? All of a sudden we wake up in a cold sweat and our heart's pounding and you know we're out of breath and we're in freak out mode. And it was just our mind playing tricks on us because we have a vivid imagination. It's the gift God gave us, this imagination, but it works against us when we use it in the daytime hours to imagine worst case scenarios. And we end up focusing on that worst case scenario. And it creates that biological, physiological response in our body that has us be hindered in our ability to find solutions because we're so paralyzed by the problem. I've heard it said that there's studies and, and they found that 98% of the things we fear never happen. I think that's probably pretty accurate that we often are so hyper vigilant to focus on all the things that could happen, all the bad things that could happen, all the things we're fearful about, and most of which never happens. But we feel that it's smart thing to do because it helps us to prevent. We think it's, it's helpful to actually prevent harm by living that vigilant lifestyle. Being hyper vigilant helps us to, you know, prevent the shit storms of life from happening. But in truth, the absolute opposite is true, that it's actually counterproductive. We're going to get into that in a moment. But there's an acronym that you've probably heard, F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. And the reason for that, of course, is because we have vivid imaginations and we imagine a lot of stuff that doesn't actually really happen. And the mountain is really just a molehill that we've expanded in our mind. Or some people consider fear F everything and run, right? It's like, run, because it seems like a threat. So we might as well just stick our tail between our legs and run away, even if we haven't really scrutinized if that threat is real. In our head, we perceive it to be real. And our perception, in many cases, becomes our reality because, again, this stress response reinforces that it's a threat because it's scary and we don't like to live scared. We don't like to experience scary things. Horror movies are the opposite of that, right? We sign up for horror movies so we can give ourselves the experience of the cortisol and the adrenaline, knowing that we have the certainty to know it's just make-believe. It's not actually true. I don't like horror movies. I don't know about you. I don't know what kind of crazy cat would want to inflict themselves with that? But some people like that. They like the rush of that adrenaline and that cortisol because there is something that gets them kind of jacked up and drugged on that energy that comes from being scared, 
right? So there is a positive side of it and a negative side of it. We've got to find a way to use the positive and mitigate the negative. Because if we don't, that fear will paralyze us. Focusing on fear kills so many assets in our corner. It kills our creativity, our resourcefulness, our confidence, our certainty, our problem-solving ability, our ability to sleep, to restore, uh, to, to rest well, to recharge our battery. It kills our energy levels many cases because it zaps us, right? Fear stops us from ste- stepping out of our comfort zone to step into the unknown boldly because we stick our tail between our legs, we lose our mojo, our confidence, our certainty, and we start to half step and pull punches. We start to stutter and we feel inadequate, right? So when we go out on stage, it stops us from going on stage and speaking boldly because we're fearful. We're going to trip on our lips, right? In many cases. Uh, Studies show that people fear death more than they do public speaking. So if you translate the logic on that, you're better off in the casket than delivering the eulogy, right? So we fear these things because we're afraid of failure and the emotional consequences of that failure. You know, it stops us from launching that business, from uh, taking that new bold initiative in our business, picking up the phone and calling a realtor, picking up the phone and making that sales call, investing in that course or in that mentoring program, it stops us because all that requires some degree of risk that has us stepping out of our comfort zone. We hit the terror barrier. And if we are more concerned about coddling our comfort zone than we are conquering that new ground and taking new ground in our life and our business, we will buckle like cheap lawn furniture and shrink back into our comfort zone. And so that's what fear stops us. People literally go to their grave with books they never wrote, with dreams they never attained, with businesses that they never launched, with all kinds of talent and ability they never unlocked and unleashed and utilized because fear stopped them. They were stuck in a prison of fear. My goal for you, friends, is that that would not be you. And that's a big reason why I'm doing this podcast today. So stress, worry, fear, weakens the immune system. You see, studies show that cultivating fearful negative emotions actually increases the odds that we attract the very thing we're fearful about. If we're fearful and we live in fear and that becomes our way of being in our emotional home, it actually deteriorates our immune system. It causes us to get sick. It causes us to have dis-ease. Dis-ease in our body creates dis-ease. That's why they say stress is a silent killer, because it's the undergirded energy that makes us have a proclivity and a propensity to sickness and disease because it weakens our immune system. When we're in stress, when we're in freak out mode, it increases the odds of financial strife, relational strife, and even adrenal fatigue is a real thing when we're living perpetually in this adrenal response with cortisol and adrenaline pumping through our veins it causes our body to deteriorate and it actually causes an autoimmune response that causes the body to destroy itself. So stress is a real killer. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why Franklin D. Roosevelt said nothing. There is nothing to fear, but fear itself. There's nothing to fear, but fear itself because he saw from his own life that most of his fear was just simply imagined. It wasn't real and it was counterproductive and it was stealing his power to create what he wanted in his life. Did you know that the command fear not or it's implied equivalent of being courageous, having faith, remaining in peace in the Bible occurs 365 times? That's one command for every day of the year. I kid you not. 365 times the Bible gives a command to either have faith, to be courageous, to be remain in peace, or to fear not. You see, God wants us to live by faith, not by fear, because he understands that if we live by fear, we're never going to take the promised land. It's like 
when he led the Israelites out of bondage in Israel, or rather in Egypt, and led him by a pillar of smoke, led them rather by a pillar of smoke to the promised land, there was all kinds of scary things they had to overcome. They had to figure out how they're going to eat. They, had, they ate by manna and all kinds of miraculous provision by God. Then when they got to the edge of the promised land, they faced the giants. They faced the high walls of the occupiers of that land. And there was scouts sent out. And all but two of those scouts said it's too scary. The walls are too high. The giants are too powerful and too big. We're going to die trying to take this land. And so they let fear stop them. And they remained in the wilderness for 40 years. Those naysayers and those fearful people that allowed their fear to stop them, they died in the wilderness. They never had their dream of entering the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey that God promised them. They never stepped into that dream and stepped into the manifest provision of God in that dream because fear stopped them. It wasn't until the next generation that was raised up and those people were anchored to the mindset of faith, anchored to the mindset of feeling the fear and doing it anyways, because they believed that God was faithful and capable to conquer those giants and to lead them into the promised land. It wasn't until then that they took the promised land. So. This is not just a biochemical, physiological response. This is not just a scientific reality that we need to be cognizant of. It's also a biblical and a spiritual principle that is 100% aligned with what we need to know and to be and to do in order to live our best life, to live a life on purpose and with purpose. I can tell you that I have struggled with fear. I've struggled with feeling inadequate, feeling like I'm not smart enough. I'm not articulate enough. I'm not charismatic enough. I'm not entertaining enough. uh, I'm not good looking enough. I actually, when I was in high school, they called me the bathroom boy. Because I spent so much time in the bathroom trying to get my hair just right, priming it this way, priming it that way. I obviously had a little bit more hair than I do now, but I was living in this lie that I have to look a certain way in order to be loved, in order to be accepted, in order to be popular, and in order to be valued. I've lived in a lie that I my value and my worth is in my performance, in my productivity. Now, when someone lives in a lie that their value and their worth is in their performance and their productivity. And that performance and productivity is at risk. Let's say debt load. Let's say the business is tanking. Let's say there's, you know, all a matter of what the world considers to be success that starts to crumble. Guess what? There's real fear. And that happened to me. I was living in this lie that my value, my worth is in my bank account, is in my productivity, my performance. And so when I faced challenges in my business, I was in over $100,000 in debt. And I was really freaked out about it, losing sleep on a consistent basis, because obviously that's a natural human response. But on top of that, my literal value and worth was tied up in my bank account. My value and worth was tied up in my performance as a provider. And so do you think that caused some stress, some worry, some fear? You better freaking believe it. So I needed to find find a way to navigate through that, that fear that was very real for me and find a way to turn that fear from a liability that stole my peace and stole my power to an asset that propelled me, that allowed me to step into the best version of myself and become resourceful and creative and innovative and inventive and allowed me to remain in peace, even in the face of the proverbial shit storms of life I was facing. So I really had to do some soul forging and some 
soul searching to find out how I can practically navigate through this fear. So if you're feeling fearful right now, welcome to the club. Welcome to the front lines of real life being human. And I'm about to share with you now three strategies, three strategies for conquering your fear, three strategies that can really help you shift that fear from something that paralyzes you to something that propels you into the best version of yourself so you can create your best life. The first strategy is connect to purpose, to connect to a purpose bigger than your fear. There's an interesting interview with Elon Musk. Of course, all of you know who Elon Musk is, richest man in the world and uh, the founder and creator of Tesla. He actually started PayPal, believe it or not, prior to launching Tesla. And he's also the owner of many different companies, including SpaceX and now Twitter. There's no doubt that he's super smart and a very savvy businessman, very intelligent and uber successful. There's no doubt about that. You might have different opinions on who you think he is or whether you think he's a good human being. I'm not going to discuss that. That's really not the point of me bringing him up. But there was an interview done after a successful launch of a mission taking a rocket into orbit with SpaceX, which seemed impossible because they were trying to get it to get into orbit and then land back with the same rocket. It would it, it literally had never been done before where they took the same rocket and instead of it just being expelled and having to rebuild a new rocket, that rocket was reusable where they can actually have it land back on Earth. And it was a big success. And of course, he's done lots of missions uh, with multiple astronauts and uh, civilians in those rockets ever since and done the seemingly impossible. And many other billionaires have followed suit, Richard Branson and, uh, and Bezos. So Elon Musk has done the seemingly impossible, right? What's never been done before. And one of the interviewers came to him and said, so you've done these incredible things. How is it that you're able to do that and not be so fearful? How is it you're able to create such an incredible, seemingly impossible feats and not be so fearful? And Elon had a very interesting response. He said, actually, I am fearful. I'm, I think, more fearful than most. And they said, well, how is it that you accomplish so much being so fearful? He said, fatalism. Fatalism. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, I'm under no illusion that what I'm trying to accomplish is exceedingly difficult. And instead of living in this delusional optimism, thinking that I'm going to have a high probability of success when in actuality I'm not, I have a fatalism approach where I assess the odds of success, and it might only be 3% chance of success, 97% chance of failure. But that just because it's a unlikely prospect of success, that does not mean it's not worth doing. What a profound distinction. Just because there is a high probability of success, that there is a high level of risk. It doesn't mean it's not doing. Why did he say that? Well, because he's connected to a higher purpose. Sure, he wants to get rich. I'm sure that's one of his ambitions. But he has a. there's only so much you're going to accomplish if your goal is just to get rich, just to seek self-interest. There's only so much risk you'll endure if your goal is just to accumulate more riches, just to you know, attain fame and fortune. There has to be something higher than that. For Elon, it's something quite unique and something that certainly sets him apart as it relates to billionaires on planet Earth. You see, his purpose is to do not only something great in the world, but to serve a higher purpose for humanity. You may not agree with it, but this is his heart connection to purpose that has him take on such extraordinary risk and still do it in spite of the fear and the very high odds of failure. And that is to build a contingency plan to sustain life 
for us humans on earth, if something happens to our planet, he wants to build a contingency plan so that there can be sustained life on Mars. I know it's far-fetched and crazy, but this is how this guy thinks. So he's serving a sacred high calling for service for humanity. And that's his higher purpose. That's what has him feel the fear and do it anyways, connecting to that higher purpose. Sacred service is really at the heart of that higher purpose. Another example, you've heard stories of, you know, people who go into car, get into car accidents and the mother that's like 97 pounds and, you know, is very weak on a normal day. All of a sudden her child is locked in the car and she needs to break into the car or lift the car up in order to keep her child alive to rescue your child. And you hear these incredible stories of the mother that pries open the door with her own hands or lifts the vehicle up to rescue her child, to do the impossible, to be superhuman with strength. Why? Connected to purpose, to rescue a loved one, a purpose higher than just self-preservation. Another example, if we look at some of the great human beings that have walked this earth that we remember to this day, like Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, etc., what makes them so unique? They all had a higher purpose, bigger than their fears, bigger than their desire for self-preservation in spite of death threats, in spite of harm to themselves. And ultimately, you know, Nelson Mandela, 27 years in prison, you know, Martin Luther King, he died for his cause. So there's the sacred service that housed these extraordinary human beings doing extraordinary things, not because they're extraordinary, but because they're tapped into an extraordinary purpose that's bigger than themselves. That's what makes them extraordinary. They're human just like us. They feel fear just like us. They see and perceive risk just like us. They feel the discomfort of stepping out of their comfort zone just like us. They feel that terror barrier experience just like us. The difference is they have a call, a mission, a purpose that's so big, it has them feel the fear and do it anyways. So shift your focus from yourself to serving and loving others. If you're having a hard time picking up the phone to reach out to realtors, connect a purpose to serve a fellow soul who needs your help to be light in the darkness. Don't focus on yourself. That's going to limit you. Focus on the light that you can be in the darkness for someone else to make a difference and impact for someone else. When you do that, it allows you to rise above your inclination, your proclivity to self-preservation and allows you to step into that divine power to serve someone else and to step into the best version of yourself, the superhero version of yourself, to feel the fear and to do it anyways. That's really what a superhero is, right? A superhero, like if we look at, uh, you know, the great superhero character of Superman, Superman, what's unique about Superman is that he has a kryptonite. He has something that makes him weak. He has something that makes him contract, that causes him to be a weakling. We have the same experience, right? When we're focusing on fear, we feel weak. We feel castrated. We feel inadequate. We feel scared. We just want to turtle, right? We want to just go in the corner and curl up in the fetal position and feel sorry for ourselves, right? That's like us, the kryptonite. What has Superman stepped in, step into his power? Staying away from that kryptonite. And for us, it's that fear, the fear of self-preservation, the fear of self-harm, the fear of what's the worst case scenario and staying stuck in that vision for our life versus who can we help? Who can we serve? What difference can we make? What is the higher purpose that makes the risk worthwhile? Let's talk about the second strategy for overcoming and mastering our fear. Second strategy is to find the nightmare. I know that sounds crazy, right? How is that supposed to help me with my fear, Doran? How is defining the nightmare and focusing on the nightmare really going to help me, Doran? Well, I'm glad you asked. You see, people cope with their fear 
with busyness, you know, pushing paper around, dealing with minutia. So when they feel the fear, they focus on the minutia to cope with the fear. And it takes their, their mind off the bank account. It takes their mind off the debt load. It takes their mind off the things that they're worried about. Or another coping mechanism is they just decide, you know, I just don't care anymore. They kind of give up. They slip into apathy or they shift into delusional optimism. That's, that's my inclination because I'm a high eye on the disc profile. High eyes are classic for this, right? Where we're heading east looking for the sunset whistling in the wind. And, you know, it doesn't matter how optimistic you are. If you're heading east looking for the sunset, we got a freaking problem, right? But delusional optimism is a real thing because we, we keep, even though what we've been doing hasn't worked, even though all the different things we've tried haven't worked, we kind of stay stuck in this whole prison of saying, you know, if I just keep trying, it's going to work. And there's truth to that. That's what keeps us being resilient. I've never heard of a successful pessimist. So we need to be optimistic to be successful as entrepreneurs, as 100% commission professionals, we need to be optimistic. But being delusionally optimistic has us going to the gunfight with a butter knife, has us heading east looking for the sunset. That doesn't help much, right? So we need to have accurate thinking. Just being optimistic alone is not enough. We need to bring accurate thinking to the table. And that's really the principle behind this, is just asking the question, what's the worst case scenario that could happen here? If you're concerned about Going back to nine to five prison, one of the ways to diminish the fear is just to really get clarity on and shine the light of truth on and find detail, minute detail. What's the consequence of getting chewed up and spat out? What's the ultimate consequence of losing your freedom, of losing your autonomy, losing your independence, You know, admitting defeat and failure, humiliation and embarrassment? having to face the family and tell, tell the family I couldn't make it work, whatever it is, getting clarity on that. Believe it or not, that actually puts rocket fuel in your rocket to be even more determined to succeed, not less, by facing the eye of the tiger. Here on Planet Prosper at MortgageMarketingCoach.com, we have a saying that says, we can't change our reality till we face our reality. Because if we're living in delusional optimism, we're going to continue to sugarcoat the problem instead of facing the eye of the tiger and getting real with the real consequence of the consequence of the problem now and the consequence of the problem persisting in the future. And if we sugarcoat it, it actually is giving us a Band-Aid when we need surgery. It's actually counterproductive. So what's the worst case scenario helps us to really face the eye of the tiger and get real? Another key part of this is really getting clarity on what not only what's the worst case scenario, but what's the contingency plan that was to happen. I'd have to go get another job. I'd have to go get a second job. I'd have to work two jobs at the same time, straddling two horses. I'd have to work more hours. But at the end of the day, are you going to die? No. Are you going to have to go through some short-term pain or maybe even some long-term pain or inconvenience? Chances are absolutely, if that were the case. But it allows you to get clarity on, hey, I'm not going to die. I'm still going to be able to feed the family. You know, yes, it's going to suck. And we don't want to diminish the suck. Yes, it's going to suck. Yes, it's not ideal. But I'm still going to be breathing. I'm still going to be kicking. I'm still going to be able to put food on the table to some degree. I'm not going to be homeless, right? And so that allows the fear to diminish because fear loves to breed in a vacuum of darkness. It loves to breed in the closet. The more you can shine the light of truth on the situation, the more it allows the power of fear to diminish because fear is the only thing that gets smaller the closer you move towards it, right? Like when I'm afraid of public speaking because it's a big crowd or because it's something I've never done before or uh, I really want to do a great job and I'm afraid of what if I screw it up? You know, one of the things that helps me is to, Think, okay, well, connect to purpose again. Who I'm there to help. If I can just help one person, it's worth it, right? What's the worst case scenario? I trip on my lips. You know, people think I'm a dumbass and, you know, they're going to forget about it and life is going to go on. And so if I can get connected to a worst case scenario, 
then it's like, okay, that's manageable. You know, I'll live through that. It's not like they're going to put me through a, 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 a some uh, death sentence consequence or tripping on my lips or messing up. Right. So it helps to get clarity on worst case scenario, not just in your head, but in your heart. So you can get really real around, you know what, it's going to suck. It would suck. It's not ideal, but it's not the end of the world. I'm still going to be alive. I'm going to be able to survive through this. I've survived through a lot before. I'll survive through that. So that's kind of a little bit going with the Elon Musk of fatalism from the standpoint of, hey, like, you know, there is a high chance of failure here. But worst case scenario, will I be able to survive that failure? Yeah, I can survive through that failure. Would it suck? Absolutely. But then here's the other side of the equation. The contingency plan allows us to realize that we're going to survive through it. And then the other piece is what's the best case scenario? Some people, they just focus on the worst case. They don't focus on the best case. It's important to cover both sides of the equation. What's the best case of the uh, scenario? The best case scenario is massive success. The best case scenario is a standing ovation. The best case scenario is, you know, being able to do that event again and have an avalanche of awesome, an avalanche of business, rave reviews, referrals, and a long-term relationship and people's lives being impact, people's hearts and minds being transformed. So the best case scenario is all the people we're able to touch, all the impact we're able to make. The best case scenario is making freedom money, the ability to do what you want, when you want, with whom you want, anytime you want. The best case scenario is building a recession-proof business, whatever it is, right? Best case scenario is to be able to live your dreams on purpose, with purpose, and prosperity. Whatever that looks like to you in the context of the fear you're facing. So you want to look at not just the negative in terms of worst case, not just the contingency plan to remind yourself you're going to survive through that shit storm regardless, but also the best case scenario of what it looks like when you knock it out of the park, hit a home run. What does that look like? What does that feel like? And how has that changed your life? And then you ask, what's the chance of success? What are the chances of success? Is it 10%? Is it 50%? Is it 80%? The more you can get clarity on that, the more you can assess the risk and the reward. And if it's a really high risk and there's a 50% chance of success or failure, and there's not much juice from that squeeze, there's a lot of risk, but not a a whole lot of reward, you probably don't want to take that risk. But if there's a moderate amount of risk or a relatively high amount of risk, 50% chance of success or failure, but there's a massive upside, that might be something worth taking. That's a bet you might want to take, right? So assess the worst case and then connect to the best case. And is the upside worth the risk? So how does this relate to your situation right now facing this market shift? You might be looking at the chance of you chewing up more savings, the chance of you having to chew up more of your net worth, jacking up the credit card or the line of credit, uh, the chance of having to you know, deteriorate more of your assets or downsize or having to go back to nine to five prison. And you're looking at you know, making a bold, intelligent, strategic investment in yourself to turn that around. Well, that risk of making that bold, intelligent, strategic investment, if it's proven, if it's ironclad, if it's battle tested, like our system is 17 years in the game, the risk is very low because it's battle tested and proven. The upside is very high because it allows you to have a recession proof business that allows you to win in any market, not just in a refi market by having the shortest path to the cash to get in top producing realtors to make you their exclusive without the hell of cold calling, begging, chasing, bribing, or kissing butts. So you can win in any market. So you can be the driver's seat in any market, not just in a refi market. And to win in the purchase market so you can rest well every night knowing that you're least and last affected by market downturns versus first and most. So that's an example of how you would assess risk to determine what's the best next step to be able to turn this from a regressing pipeline into a hyper expanding growth pipeline that allows you to multiply your income, even in the face of 
a challenging market like we're facing right now. Now, the third strategy that I want you guys to... Oops, I got the wrong one here. The third strategy that I want you guys to uh, look at is focusing on what you want. Cultivate courage and commitment. The last one I was focusing on is define the nightmare. I had the wrong label up on the screen, so we're getting that sorted now. But uh, the third strategy is focusing on what you want. Focus on what you want. Cultivate courage and commitment. So fear is an opportunity for courage to rise. Burn the retreat boats, right? When they were conquering the new lands, they brought ships. And one of their secrets to success is burn the retreat boats. It's win or die. There is no freaking backup plan. Go all in. All in is the only way to win. Winning happens when losing is no longer an option. Another great example of that is Henry Ford. You know, he de developed the Model T and then he wanted to create the V8, which was impossible, the engineer said. To cast it all in one cast, the engineer said it's possible, impossible. Ford said, do it anyways. And so they went to work day after day, week after week, month after month, continually and perpetually reporting to Ford. It's impossible. No progress, no success. What you're asking us to do is not possible, sir. And after a whole year of that, and a whole year of failure with fruitless toil, they told Ford, what you're asking us to do is literally impossible. And Ford said, go ahead, keep trying. I want it and I will have it. And a few months later, they cracked the code and they did the impossible. They created the V8 engine. How is it that they were able to do the seemingly impossible? Everyone was saying it was impossible because it had never been done before. The possible, the impossible was made possible because of Ford's vision, his conviction, his courage. And he knew that if he could put that seed of faith in their hearts and keep them on the payroll with that seed of faith, that the boss believes enough in this to invest this much time and this much money and to be this patient and this determined that maybe, maybe, maybe if we continue to collaborate and persist and continue to be creative and innovative, that there might be a slight possibility that this would pay off. And it's that persistence that beat the resistance. So believe in yourself, believe in your dream. Believe that even in spite of the failures or the challenges or the setbacks, that there's always a way for the committed. There is no obstacle too big for the committed. Change the meaning of your situation. This is another key piece of this uh, equation when it comes to focusing on what you want and cultivating courage and commitment. It's changing the meaning of your situation. You see, if you're on a roller coaster ride and there's two riders, one rider might be scared shitless because they feel like they're going to die on the ride. The other one is excited because they're up for an adventure and they know that they're not going to die and it's going to be scary as hell, but it's going to be fun because they have certainty that they're not going to die and it's going to be an adventure. What do you think the difference is in the biochemistry and the physiology of those two people? Right, One's in the parasympathetic, the other one's in the sympathetic. One's in freak out mode, the other one's in adventure fun mode. Right, One's in adrenaline and cortisol land. The other one's in serotonin and endorphin land. So meaning matters. Change the meaning of what's happening and you'll find that it shifts your emotional state. It's not happening to you. It's happening for you. I know that can sound very trite and cliche, but what if the challenge you're facing right now is there to serve you to the best version of yourself? You see, because without pressure... There are no diamonds. So let's use that pressure not to pulverize you, but to polish you, not to make you bitter, but to make you better, to step into the best version of yourself. So a few tools, a few exercises to help you with this. The first is courage journal. A courage journal allows you to look back and cite all the references when you felt the fear, you did it anyways. All the times when the odds were stacked against you and you found a way to overcome. All the times when... You know, everyone said it wasn't possible and you made it happen. When you had fear, 
and self-doubt, but you conquered that fear and you did it in spite of the fear and you came up on top. See, when you journal those, it reminds you the badass that you are. When you journal those, it reminds you that this is nothing new, that this might be a new challenge, but you're not new to challenges. And so that allows you to step into that courage because again, fear is simply an opportunity for courage to rise. Another example of a way to cultivate this way of being that allows you to feel the fear and do it anyways is a gratitude journal where you're journaling the things you're grateful for, thankful for, your spouse, your kids, your home, your health, all the things you can think of you're grateful for. You know, just the fact that you have a sound mind, just the fact that you you know that you have a God who loves you, who's sustaining you, who's upholding you. Whatever it is, connecting to gratitude, because gratitude connects you to infinite source of supply. Another tool in the toolbox to cultivate courage is visualization, to visualize yourself conquering the proverbial promised land, flowing with milk and honey, to visualize yourself coming out on top, to visualize yourself in prosperity. What's it look like, feel like, smell like, taste like, sound like when you're living your dream now, to connect to that feeling to see yourself being victorious. And of course, where your energies go, where your focus goes, your energies flow and results show. So when you focus on victory, you tend to attract more victory just by virtue of the fact that you're more resourceful, more resilient, more persistent, that you have emotional states that allow you to have that pep in your step and the sparkle in your eye that allows you to attract more success because it allows you to step into a powerful state that allows you to increase the odds of getting powerful results. Affirmations is another great tool. So one of the things I'll say if I'm in fear mode is I'll come back to seeing myself being successful. I'll come back to imagining myself on top in victory, imagining the best case scenario and feeling it as if, I've already ha- as if I already have it, to give thanks in advance for it as if I already have it. But then I'll start to affirm it. If I'm facing a money challenge, I'll come back to one of my favorite affirmations. I'm so happy and grateful. Now that money comes to me in ever-increasing quantities through multiple sources of income on a continuous basis. Yes, I'll affirm what I want to create. So affirmations are very powerful. I know I'm always divinely guided. Everything always works out for me. More and more, I'm attracting abundance and success. Those sorts of affirmations allow you to shift from a sympathetic state in fear, fight, flight, or freeze into a parasympathetic state in that relaxed confidence, living by faith instead of by fear. Another powerful tool is breathing techniques. Breathing techniques. So breathing techniques really is about coming back to the breath of the parasympathetic. (sighs) Three deep breaths. Go ahead and do that now. Three deep breaths. (sighs) (sighs) Notice how that feels. Chances are you're going to notice your muscle tension getting more relaxed, right? Chances are you're going to just notice a lift in your energy a lift in your energetic frequency. Before I go to bed, oftentimes I'll do a four count in and a deep breath out to shift my state. And while I'm saying it, I say, I am so very blessed. And on the last count, I breathe out. So four breaths in, one breath out. I am so very blessed. And that, again, shifts from sympathetic in contraction and fear and stress to parasympathetic in peace and faith and that relaxed state that allows me to drift into sleep. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. That's another tool in the toolbox to cultivate courage. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. This is one of the reasons why I start my day off exercising. Start my day off getting up early. As Benny Franklin said, early to bed, early to rise makes you healthy, wealthy, and wise. So I go to bed early, I get up early, and while everyone else is sleeping, I'm having my God time, meeting with my maker, connecting to peace and purpose. And then I'll go to the gym and 
going to the gym, clanging and banging and exercising early in the morning, yoning allows me to raise my energetic frequency and I'm getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Something about clanging and banging and lifting more weight than you're comfortable with gets you comfortable being uncomfortable because without the strain and the pain, there is no gain. So you start to hardwire this, uh, this relationship around strain and stress where it's like, you know what? I'm comfortable being uncomfortable. I'm totally okay feeling overwhelmed. I'm totally okay feeling outside of my comfort zone because I train in the gym, overwhelming my muscles every day. And that's how I get stronger. That's how I get fitter. That's how I build muscle. Same thing with why I take cold showers. I learned from Tony Robbins that there's something called cold, sh cold showers where you can get a free cryotherapy session right out the tap every day just by virtue of turning on the cold water and keeping it straight cold. And I'll step into that cold shower Monday to Friday, not because I'm a masochist, but because it washes away my wimp self, my chump self, my inadequacy self, my imposter syndrome self, and all my excusitis and all my justifications and rationalizations on why I can't and why I won't. And what's galvanized in its place is my champion self. I wash away all the fear, all the doubt, and what remains is my champion self. And the pep in my step, the spark on my eye, the energy is incredible. I feel like I can walk through a freaking brick wall. So that cold shower is one of the tools you can cultivate, you can use to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Another thing you might want to consider using is to plan your work, work your plan, and block schedule proactive prospecting. We call it hour of power. So yes, you need a system to get these realtors hot for what you got. Yes, you need a system. So instead of cold calling and being the unwelcome guest, you can be positioned as the welcome guest. Instead of being the annoying pest, be the welcome guest. Instead of being seeing it as a loan leech and a mortgage parasite, you become irreplaceable and indispensable. That's why people hire us. That's why loan officers hire us. That's why mortgage professionals hire us is to learn the secret sauce on how to do that because it's not an easy code to crack. But the cool thing is, is that once you have that in place, you can block scheduled time to reach out to these realtors that are already receptive and open to have a conversation with you. And by virtue of blocking in your calendar, planning your work and working your plan, now you've got proactive prospecting that now you're able to cultivate being comfortable, being uncomfortable every day, stepping out of your comfort zone. You do that enough, you get mighty comfortable. And all of a sudden now it's like, man, I could eat this for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I can do this in my sleep. And it now is no longer uncomfortable because you've put in so many reps. Now it's your comfort zone. Instead of outside of your comfort zone, it's in your comfort zone. So all that to be said, that one of the strategic shifts that really makes a massive difference, if you're in a place where you're struggling in your business, if you're in a place where your pipeline is dwindling, if you're noticing that these realtors are not giving you the time of day, if you're noticing that fear is really getting the best of you and you're having a hard time navigating through your fear and you're having a hard time being effective in your marketing and finding a way to penetrate the purchase market powerfully. One of the tools you can use that can powerfully shift you out of fear and into faith, out of uncertainty into certainty is investing strategically in mentoring, hiring an expert to condense decades into days. So instead of just throwing yogurt at the fan, hoping something sticks and and hoping it's going to pan out, you can use a recipe. You can model a proven system so you don't have to try and reinvent the wheel. You can actually deploy a plug-and-play turnkey system that allows you to get winning results without having to try and reinvent the wheel, just kind of winging it. See, for example, if you're wanting to conquer a new mountain and you have to take a treacherous hike through you know, all kinds of treacherous uh terrain on that mountain and you've never taken that mountain before, that can be very scary, right? And so your risk is very high. Your chance of success is very low. But if you were to hire an expert guide who has gone through that mountain pass thousands of times and helped others do the same, then you can go from uncertainty to certainty, from lack of confidence to total confidence. And the probability of success goes sky high and the risk drops to pretty much nothing. Why? Because you had a mentor, you have a guide to take you by the hand and to help you navigate in these unknown 
areas that you just don't know what you don't know. And so that's the power of having a mentor in your corner. The quest here, friends, is to build a rock solid recession proof business that allows you to win in any market. So instead of being in the passenger seat, you can be in the driver's seat. Instead of waiting for the phone to ring, you can make the phone ring. Instead of holding your breath and just hoping and wishing and praying that rates drop, you can be in the power position regardless of market conditions, regardless of rates, regardless of inventory, regardless of the economy. You can prosper in any economy. You can win in any market, not just a refi market. So if you're in a place where you're wanting that kind of help with a success certain plan and you're 100% commission mortgage professional and you're wanting to take your business to the next level and not wait for you know things to finally get back to normal again, who knows how long that's going to take, right? It could take 12 months. It could take 24 months. It could take 36. Only God knows. But if you're sick and tired of being a victim to the market, if you're sick and tired of waiting for the phone to ring versus making the phone ring, if you're sick and tired of being in the passenger seat versus the driver's seat, and you're ready to learn how to win in any market, and you have an 85 basis points or higher compensation plan, and you're on 100% commission, and you want to learn how to you know, really flip the script so that realtors need you more than you need them and flip the script so that you become irreplaceable and indispensable to these top producing realtors so that they work on your terms and they send you all their business all the time and make you their exclusive lender. Then I invite you to book a breakthrough call at mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. That's mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. We'll have a conversation with either myself or one of my consultants. We'll lift up the hood on your business. We'll look at what's working, what's not working, where you're at now in your business, where you want to take it. And if we can help you create a breakthrough in your business, by all means, we'll show you, show you what that looks like. And if not, frankly, we'll be the first to advise you to pass. But either way, our goal for you is you leave that call with massive value, massive clarity. Chances are we're going to have some fun. Fair enough. So if that sounds fair to you, and it definitely should, I invite you to book a call at mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. There you have it, friends. We've covered all the essentials on what you need to know in order to conquer your fear, master your fear, to live by faith, not by fear, but not living in delusional optimism, living in accurate thinking, and to put fear under your feet and not have it paralyze you, but have it propel you to your best life the abundant life that you know in your heart you're called to and capable of. My name is Dorn Aldana coming at you from the Art of Mortgage Marketing podcast. Looking forward to bringing you another great episode next week. I trust you got some value from this episode. Be blessed and let's get after it, friends. Take massive action. Bring massive, positive, and productive, and peaceful, and poised, and confident action and bring that emotion of certainty, knowing you have a winning system with a winning plan. And if you don't have one, book a call at mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. Let's see if we can get you that proven plan to help you prosper, not just in this market, but in any market. You do that, you're going to get massive results. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon. Peace, y'all.